Professor, welcome. What I see, Thank you. yeah, what I see in uh, what is happening now in Gaza, I see a certain analogy in the way that the media and the governments react to what is happening, as if there's no context, no history before that. And uh, I see the analogy between the way that the war in Ukraine is being portrayed, namely, what is totally lacking from our information to the public is context and history. It's for Ukraine, Ukraine, and it's for Gaza, the same thing. Uh, do you concur or, or do you have a different view on those things? Well, what we're learning is uh, how uh, poorly uh, we uh, act to avoid conflict because uh, this uh, war now raging uh, in Israel and Palestine uh, and the uh, war in Ukraine were both completely avoidable through diplomacy. We don't seem to do diplomacy anymore. Uh, we uh, turn our eyes away from terrible problems. When they explode in terrible ways, then we say, oh, now we need a, a military solution to them. This doesn't work. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, the leaders in the United States understood nothing uh, of uh, Ukraine and understood nothing of uh, the Israel-Palestine issue. Indeed, uh, our uh, national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said uh, and wrote just a week before the October 7th massacre and now the war in Gaza, that the Middle East is quieter than it's been in 20 years. This shows clearly a complete lack of understanding. So the problem is uh, our governments do not understand what's going on uh, on the ground, uh, either in Ukraine or in uh, Israel and Palestine, nor uh, I would say in most other parts of the world, because I'm traveling to these places all the time. I see what's on the ground. I know that especially the United States government is blind to ground realities. And unfortunately, for some weird reason, uh, Europe became NATO, which means US policy, rather than Europe, as I used to know it, which was a, a European sensibility. So we uh, are very confused, but basically the United States is confused and Europe is confused by following a confused United States. Uh, that is something that I can totally agree with and that we on our website portray in, in a similar way, namely uh, a total lack of understanding and also a total lack, if I may add, of respect for other views on the issues as if how we see things is the way and there's no other way to see things. But uh, is it just this cultural, political uh, EU, because you mentioned the EU as well, or is there more to it? For example, there are also people who say, well, actually, they knew this was going to happen. And they said, OK, that's good. We'll become, we want those walls. That's a very, very, very sharp uh, view. I, I differ on those things. But there are elements within policy making that make you think, well, actually, they could have if they wanted to avoid this. But there are some elements that just do not want this to be solved in a peaceful manner. Would you agree? Well, uh, I, I would say I know the American leaders, they're not very clever. <laughs> That's all. This is not some, uh, this is not some uh, dark conspiracy. They don't understand. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and the reason, by the way, is an extreme arrogance. They don't try to understand. They think power defines reality. In fact, we had people who said, uh, what is reality? It's the way we define reality. That was in the Bush administration. But this is the same behavior uh, of this crowd. It's basically one kind of uh, uh, neocon uh, ideology which has prevailed in Washington for years. What's the essence of it? The essence of it is we are the strongest superpower in the history of the world. Biden just repeated it again. He's a tired old man who doesn't understand what's going on in the world. And he's surrounded apparently by, I don't, I just find them, 
<laughs> devoid of uh, knowledge. So I no, it's not a conspiracy. It's just uh, stupidity often, because there were many opportunities to learn more, and they don't even try to learn. They don't try to see it from the perspective of the other side. That's the biggest problem. Uh, and that's the problem of our media also. They don't ask any questions. They just know the other side's evil, so we don't even have to listen to what the other side says. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an incredibly naive position. Of course, the media are basically just repeating uh, the, the narratives coming out of the governments. Europe is basically repeating the narratives coming out of Washington. And Washington is, is uh, like, like a, a giant without a head. Uh, they don't think anymore. They don't look. They just say, we're so powerful. We can do what we want. And it's failing everywhere. That's the problem. It's unraveling. And it's sad for your city, by the way, a, a wonderful city. Uh, the biggest mistake Europe made in my opinion, if I may say so, was to put NATO headquarters and European Union headquarters in the same place. These are two completely different things. Well, uh, and they should be completely different things. Well, I, I'm, I'm already, uh, I'm, I'm, I was quite young, but I remember why NATO headquarters moved from Paris, where they were uh, originally, to Brussels. And the Belgian authorities, they just did it for mer for mercantile reasons. So they had jobs, uh, buildings, stuff. That's how low the standard was to accept a military <laughs> organization like that. But you mentioned arrogance, uh, ignorance, and so on. I do recognize that in our own EU and uh, EU member states governments, but uh, without the power. I simply do not understand, if you look at his European history, how they have become so willingly dependent on whatever Washington DC says. I just don't get it because it goes against their economic interests. And, and, and at the end of the day, it's all about economics, right? I spoke to a, a leader in Europe who, as usual, I was complaining uh, that Europe doesn't speak up for its own interests. He said, Jeff, they treat us like children in Washington. Now, why you would let yourself be treated like children is is quite another matter. Europe is uh, Europe, Europe is history of three thousand years. The United States uh, is uh, young, arrogant, and ignorant by those standards. Why doesn't Europe tell Washington something about how to behave uh, with all the experience Europe had with wars, uh, with all of the breakthroughs that Europe had? Uh, in forming a, a true community or union? Why doesn't Europe share some knowledge, avoid the wars? I'll give you an example. The precipitating cause of the Ukraine war is this NATO enlargement, this constant drumbeat. We're going to surround Russia with our military bases everywhere. Anyone that doesn't understand this just hasn't been, been paying attention for decades to this. Now, in 2008, when George W. Bush Jr., not the brightest of our presidents, I might say, this is pretty clear, uh, when he pushed NATO enlargement to uh, Ukraine at the Bucharest NATO summit, and European, yeah. leaders, European leaders said to me at the time, my God, what's your president doing? This is so dangerous. This is so provocative. Why is he doing this? But they all said it privately. And then the United States pushed and they said, OK, OK, we won't set a roadmap, but we'll make the commitment and so forth. Oh, come on. This is really weak. And you could watch the steps one by one to how this comes to war in the end, especially the big step in February 2014 when <laughs> the United States helped to overthrow the Ukraine government, because the Ukraine government, the president Yanukovych was for neutrality rather than for NATO enlargement. And again, the European leaders went along with this. Come on, this is sensible, this is safe, this is prudent, no. And then the European leaders went along with completely dissing the Minsk II agreement 
which was a chance, you know, ratified by the UN Security Council to actually make some peace. Again, Belgium is a good example. Belgium, you know, it's complicated by national uh, country, uh, not always getting along. It's a complicated history. Belgium should understand Ukraine has a similar problem. That's what Minsk II was about. Okay, couldn't a Belgian leader stand up and tell the truth to say to the Ukrainians, you know, probably better, we have some experience with this. Uh, we had to even divide the library of the University of Louvain because, you know, every other book had to go to the other, other, other university. Belgium went through this. So why can't there be some shared wisdom in Ukraine? You know, you really should have a, a federal system. You really should have some decentralization. I know the Americans, they're so stupid. Uh, when Minsk II came, they told the Ukrainians, oh, don't worry about it. We want a unitary state. You know, we like the Western Ukrainians in charge right now. You don't have to give in. Even when the UN Security Council backs this, even when France and Germany in the Normandy process say, we are the guarantors of the Minsk II agreement. So, you know, I think the mainstream media, by the way, it's, I don't know what got into them, but they don't do their job, which is why we're talking, because the mainstream media would have all the eyes on them, but nobody believes them anymore because they don't tell anything about the real context in which these crises are occurring. And people sense that, they know that. That's why they're looking for alternative sources of information. It's, a, it's good that you mention our own country's federal system here. I can tell you, it's complex, it's complicated if I say, and even the average Belgian doesn't understand it, but hey, it works. I it's better than war, isn't and, it? Yeah, and, and we go about our business every day here in Brussels. We don't fight each other. On the contrary, we have a lot of discussions and we say, oh, no, this, and you, the French thing, and this and that. And afterwards, we go have a beer together. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i I'm, I'm simplifying here. It's more complicated. But you are raising a point here, namely that this model, this model could very well be something for Ukraine. And who knows, maybe for Israel-Palestine, it's more complicated. Exactly, exactly. And by the way, this was negotiated in Ukraine, actually negotiated, signed, sealed, and backed by the UN Security Council, and then completely ignored. And I know why in the United States, because big campaign contributors said, oh, we don't want a federal system in Ukraine. And so the politicians jump right into line also because they're ignorant and arrogant, because they say it doesn't really matter. We are the ones that are gonna be able to push this through. Think yeah. of the arrogance of overthrowing Yanukovych. This is what, and who was the point person on that? Our current Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland. You know, the famous one who's caught on the phone. Fuck the Europeans, if you'll excuse my language, but that's her language. Caught on tape, that's your closest ally in Europe. That's Isn't that wonderful? Mm, Come on, yes, absolutely. you can do better than now, this. Now to... Uh to uh, go back to the present situation. We know uh, that in any negotiation is out of the question for the moment in Russia, Ukraine, for reasons that you have already elaborated on other ways where the US, UK and others said, no way, you're going to keep fighting till the last Ukrainian. But uh, Israel, Palestine, Gaza, uh, when the UN is asking for it, many countries, in fact, only two days ago, all the Arab the, uh, Arab uh, ambassadors here at the EU, and there are a lot of ambassadors here in Brussels, they uh, had the same point of view. We want immediate ceasefire and a passing of all humanitarian aid. That is their common goal. So basically what it means is that Gaza has reunited the Arab countries, which is not exactly on what the agenda of Israel and the United States was about. Yeah, even uh, China has brought together uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia in, in recent months. So uh, we're, we're really in, in a situation where the United States uh, basically stands alone. And Europe uh, is, you know, looking around, uh, well, what do we do? Uh, because our 
you know, uh, the United States is doing this, so we have to follow them. But you look at the vote in the UN Security Council or uh, the, the, uh, on, on uh, Brazil's resolution for a ceasefire, it was 12 to 1, the 1 being the United States standing alone. Uh, there were two abstentions, the UK, because the UK couldn't take a step can't go to the loo, if I may say so, without the United States permission. Uh, and uh, Russia, for technical reasons, since it was uh, uh, basically uh, backing this uh, intricate process, but very much in favor of the ceasefire. In other words, the United States stood alone. Okay, and gives a, a blank check to Israel to continue massive bombing in Gaza. Boy, the whole world is uh, absolutely unhappy about this. And since we know that there is going to be no peace in this region by military might, there's only going to be peace by a political settlement. And that political settlement, by the way, was promised decades ago of a Palestinian state, and it has never been brought to fruition. Well, this is, again, arrogance. This is uh, Jake Sullivan's arrogance. The Middle East is quieter than ever before because the United States, because it doesn't listen, doesn't learn, doesn't look, said, well, everything's fine, everything's quiet. We'll negotiate for Israel to have uh, uh, relations with the Arab states uh, as it was trying to do with Saudi Arabia and ignore the Palestine problem because uh, you know uh, the hardliners in Israel don't want it. And so that was the U.S. arrogance, which is we don't have to look to a political settlement. And now the U.S. absolutely is lost because the whole world is screaming, ceasefire, stop the murders in front of our eyes of thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of people in Gaza under bombs of civilian populations. And we can't figure out that that is absolutely something that should not happen. That's where we are right now. Well, there is then uh, what we do, for example, with our website here on the level of uh, our little country is try to inform public opinion on the other, well, I say other or whatever you call it, a version of things, analysis of things. Because uh, there was a, a big rally here in Brussels, 40,000 people for for a ceasefire etc but what i do find by other people and i ask are you coming or are you coming lots of people just say well i don't really understand what's going on there i mean after decades 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 of this conflict going on people most people still do not know what it is really about they have some vague idea about two opponents that's about it but uh would you say that the situation with public opinion in the u.s is similar where most people just avoid the issue because they don't really know what this is about it's interesting i think i think i don't have the hard evidence but i think there's a generational divide also i mean there's general ignorance but uh, there is a generational divide where older people in the united states tend to say you know israel is uh, all all uh, right and younger people tend to know after decades something's really wrong in how the Palestinian people have been treated and so I think that there's a gap also uh, across the generations and that's we're seeing it even in the universities uh, where the students are saying you know this is not fair uh, what Israel's doing and uh, the the older people and the donors to the universities and so forth say quiet uh, you don't talk about Palestine. Uh, this is all about Israel. And so we're, we're seeing some of that uh, divide intergenerationally also. But in general, <laughs> we don't try to understand context. And uh, it, it's like George Orwell told us uh, in uh, his great uh, novel, which looks more and more like history, 1984, uh, that uh, history is to go down the memory hole. Uh, it's to be rewritten for the convenience of those in power today. Uh, basically, the favorite word of our, our government narratives is unprovoked. The word unprovoked. Uh, this is meant to 
say, you don't have to know anything about context. You don't have to know anything about history. This just came out of the blue. It's just pure evil. Uh, and uh, so you don't have to understand the past. Uh, you just have to side with the military approach. Uh, and uh, the problem is that does not solve any problems. And since I've, I'm now 68 years old, I've lived through basically nonstop U.S. wars. 70 on this side. Yes, there you go. You know, I've seen, but for me as an American, it's just war all the time. And that, by the way, was also George Orwell's insight that it would be perpetual war. Uh, of course, you'd erase which side you're on. So uh, occasionally you'd be told it's uh, uh, not Eurasia, it's uh, now the other one. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's incredible. But this is my whole life. I've been told by Washington, don't worry, everything's fine. It's all under control. We have the most powerful military, we'll solve it. Militaries do not solve political problems. Political problems are solved by politics. And the problems in Ukraine and in Israel, Palestine are political problems. Mm -hmm. They're not amenable to military solutions. Absolutely. Uh, I do remember because we talk about context and history, uh, when a Native American uh, leader was talking here uh, in Brussels a few years ago, and he said, you're mispronouncing history. It's always his story that you're telling. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, you got a point there. History is what the victor uh, tells you it is. But anyway, it is indeed a, a good a sign of, well, to be positive. Indeed, here also the younger people who are saying, listen, guys, because it's mostly guys who do the stuff. Listen, guys, this cannot go on like this. We have to really change the things. Anyway, do you any last remarks, uh, Professor? Well, I, I think the main point is it's never too late to negotiate. It's not right, even in Ukraine, to say, well, it's, it's just going to have to run its course. What's running its course is the lives of thousands of Ukrainians every week who are going to their slaughter. This country is not being saved by NATO. It's being destroyed by this quest for NATO, which is not going to happen because that is viewed by Russia as a fundamental threat. And we've known that all along. And if we had any prudence at all, we would have saved Ukraine. But to this day, all Biden has to do is pick up the phone to Vladimir Putin and say, President Putin, <clears throat> we have reconsidered this NATO enlargement. We've heard your complaint. Now, we want to talk with you about ending this conflict and the Russian troops going home and solving this thing peacefully without NATO enlarging and threatening you and getting back to solving the problems within Ukraine as the Minsk agreement had tried to do. Now, this is the call that has never been made from Washington. I don't know if they know how to pick up the phone anymore. I keep offering them my Zoom link. They can use my mobile. They can make the call, but they have not even tried in recent years. And this is what we need. And diplomacy can work in Israel and Palestine. It can work in Ukraine. It can work in general to stop wars. And that's the approach we should take.